just please hold comments while SPS TV takes us live. After a five second pause, I will call us to order. Okay, this is President DeWolf. I am now calling the April 29th, 2020 regular board meeting to order at one o'clock on Wednesday, April 29th, 2020. Um, we live and go to school in a city that is the ancestral homeland to the Duwamish people, Muckleshoot Nation and Suquamish Nation. We acknowledge them as custodians of this land since time immemorial. And as guests, and in many of our cases, as settlers on this land, we extend our deepest gratitude and respect to their ancestors and elders past, present, and future. So Tansi, Okimao, Piisim, Nitisi, Nikason, um, welcome. Uh, my traditional Korean name is Yama Buffalo Leader. Thank you all. Ms. Wilson-Jones, I'm going to ask you to start with a uh, roll call, please. Wilson? Here. Director Harris? Here. Director Hersey? Here. Director Mack? Here. Director Rankin? Here. Director Rivera-Smith? I'm here. Director DeWolf? I'm here as well. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Superintendent Juno is also joining us for today's meeting and additional staff will be briefing the board as we move through today's agenda. This meeting is being held electronically consistent with the governor's March 24th, 2020 proclamation prohibiting meetings such as this one from being held in person. And I'll note that members of the public may also be joining us via phone or online streaming. I will not be asking members of the public to identify themselves, but thank you to those of us, to those of you for joining us. As stated on the agenda, there will not be a public comment opportunity today per the board's March 11th, 2020 vote to waive relevant provisions of board policy 1430 and board procedure 1430 BP, as well as board resolution 2019 20-29. Public comments are always invited by email to the board at schoolboard at saleschools.org by fax and by mail as stated on the agenda. And we absolutely do still welcome all public comment. To facilitate this meeting, I will ask participants to assure, ensure you are muted when you're not speaking. Staff may be, may be muting participants to address feedback and ensure we can hear directors and staff. I am now going to turn it over to Superintendent Juno for her comments. Okay, well, thank you and good to uh, virtually see everybody. I guess I, uh, Ellie, when we get to the next slide, I'll just tell you next slide. Uh, so I just want to start by saying I had the opportunity to pop into a fifth grade classroom today. Um, and it was really awesome. Mr. Barnes fifth grade class was engaged in a science uh, lesson. They had all taken individual nature walks and collected data about um, different things. And they were all engaged with looking at other data sites and comparing what they saw and what they heard um, to wind, uh, to when the, what the weather was like, time of day. Um, they were still really engaged with each other. They, as the video went in and out, they teased each other on uh, sounding like aliens and um, all that kind of stuff. And so I guess it was just really nice for me to actually see and observe that learning is happening. Um, that was just one example I know of one teacher in one classroom, but I do miss the days of being able to pop into schools and sort of see good things happening in the classrooms. And so that was just really nice. And so I just wanted to let people know that, uh, at least in this instance, great things were going on and um, teaching and learning was indeed happening. And so next slide, please. Oh, I can do it, I guess, Never mind. Uh, as always, I just want to ground today's superintendent comments in our strategic plan. We continue to build these new systems using the theory of action of this plan, centering on students and families furthest from educational justice, 
specifically African-American boys, young men, and their families. Um, next slide. Um, in alignment with our strategic plan, the following principles um, guided development of the new grading practices and reflect our unwavering commitment to advancing racial equity and SPS. I just want to thank the board for voting for this. Um, these were the principles that we grounded it in was to ensure that the negative impact of these school closures on students, especially students furthest from educational justice is minimized, um, that we wanted to keep students engaged in learning and keep educators engaged in teaching. We wanted to make sure that we were engaging families as partners in supporting their students. And of course, meet the state's requirement to make a good faith effort in providing meaningful high school credit earning opportunities and provide space for flexibility and individualized plans to ensure equitable outcomes and promote common expectations across all schools. And give, uh, with our strategic plan, we made sure we centered our black boys and young men in this process. I'm really proud of this work and really want to thank uh, the CAI team for doing really deep work across departments and making sure that all voices were included as much as possible uh, for the engagement that went on and um, for really making sure that our strategic plan was lived out in this process. And others across the nation and across Washington State are now modeling their efforts on it. And so we, again, leaders, um, a leading district in this effort. So thank you again, everybody. Um, next slide. Uh, so this, I am just really want to just take a few minutes to highlight some of the great work that staff across the district have been doing since our closure. Next slide. In alignment with Seattle Excellence, we've been deploying computers to students furthest from educational justice for the past month. We started with seniors to ensure they meet the requirements to be ready for college, career, and community. And then we next deployed to high school students. And this week, we are starting to hand out computers to middle school students furthest from educational justice. There are great stories pouring in from all across the city um, just about the, the, our our ability to be able to make this um, happen. And I do want to just again thank Amazon. Um, we are delivering computers to elementary students as a result of their really generous donation. And you can see in the left picture there the joy that our teachers are bringing to their students. This is a preschool student enjoying a read aloud with her teacher. The other two pictures are from our laptop deployment sites. And you can't see it, but each employee is smiling behind those masks. Next slide, please. Uh, here are some of the other COVID essential staff. The top left picture shows the learning packet team sorting hundreds of thousands of papers to get out to schools on Mondays. Uh, the bus delivery uh, system that we have um, are delivering meals to families in the Aki Kurosi Middle School service area. You'll see a couple other familiar characters on that picture. The nutrition staff is serving over 4,000 meals per day. And this team on the bottom is at Meany Middle School. This healthcare worker at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance models one of the 100 3D printed masks that the makerspace at Nathan Hale High School has made. Um, and so that is just really, again, shows how caring our schools are and how we're being great partners with the community and the frontline workers across our city. And we're just really fortunate to have so many wonderful people in our community. We truly are stronger together. And I am still convinced that we will come out of this situation stronger. And I'm so thankful to be leading these efforts with you, my board. Um, and I just need to make sure that we are reminding everybody to be safe and wash your hands. And with that, President Wolf, I hand it back over. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Juneau. Um, really, really grateful for that update. And certainly, um, if, if anything, uh, I appreciated the highlight of, um, of our students. Uh, stories have been coming out over the last couple of weeks of, of SPS students um, rising to the challenge. And I'm really um, proud and grateful to be a part of this district as well. 
We have now reached the consent portion of today's agenda. So may I have a motion for the consent agenda? I move approval of the consent agenda. I second the motion. Okay, approval of the consent agenda has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. Do directors have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, the consent agenda has passed unanimously. And now we will move to the action items on today's agenda. As we move through these items and later the introduction items, I will first call on committee chairs for items that move through committee. Then I'll call on the remaining directors alphabetically for questions and comments. So we will now move to action item number one, authorizing board resolution number 2019-20-33 to suspend state and local graduation requirements and suspending provisions of board policy number 2415 high school graduation requirements. May I have a motion for this item? This is Director Hampson. I move that the school board authorize the attached board resolution and temporarily suspend identified provisions of board policy number 2415 high school graduation requirements for high school seniors during the COVID-19 school closure. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. I second the motion. Thank you, directors. The item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. This, this, this topic was discussed, however, by the Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee, but the board action report came has come straight through to the board given the time sensitive nature. So we'll begin with a briefing from Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Diane DeBacker. Thank you, President DeWoof and members of the board. As reflected in the motion, the purpose of this bar is to authorize the resolution number 2019-20-33 to suspend state and local graduation requirements and suspend provisions of board policy number 2415, the high school graduation requirements. Um, as we shared at last week's CNI committee meeting, we have had a few overarching goals that have um, guided us as we've worked through this, with the first being keeping seniors engaged in learning and planning, and second, help those seniors graduate and continue with their post-secondary plans as they intended. As is noted in the bar, we focus first on students further from educational justice as evidenced by the racial equity analysis, We've also sought to engage a number of stakeholders in these meetings. We've informed students and families of the potential waivers in early April. We started consulting with a number of school district and even state level colleagues at this time so that we could approach the waivers in the best manner possible. We're grateful for the collaboration between Dr. Mia Williams team and Dr. Keisha Scarlett's team to help us with outreach and engagement to seniors and their families, especially using our community-based um, organizations and others that are really have their, their um, finger on the pulse of these communities. The bar, bar tries to be very, a very complex topic. It includes information on what is in House Bill uh, 2965, it includes what's in the rules that the State Board of Education developed to implement House Bill 2965. It is complex in that it talks about the district's application to the state with respect to House Bill 2965. Um, and it details the resolution that's also in front of you today. In addition, given the complexity of the number of types of requirements our seniors need to meet, 
um, we would draw your attention and hope you've had a chance to look at the summary chart that's on pages four and five of the bar. And it kind of gives you an idea of all of the different type of scenarios that we tried to play through as we were considering each student's situation. We are asking for action or intro and action on the same day because we believe that time is of the essence here. We need to launch this process as soon as possible. As you have heard before and read in the bar, this is an individual student um, waiver process. We have about 4,000 senior students in Seattle Public Schools, and so it's really going through every student's transcript, meeting with the students, making sure that they know what options that they have with the waivers, and also if we combine that with the grading policy that you passed last week. Um, we do appreciate the support from the Curriculum and Instruction uh, Committee that met last week. We give gratitude also to the Executive Committee for allowing this to be both introed and actioned, hopefully in the same meeting. I will give credit uh, where credit is due, certainly here, and that's to Dr. Caleb Perkins and his college and Coretti college and career readiness team and Dr. Perkins is on the line and can help respond to any questions you have. With that, President DeWoof, I will stand for questions. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to call on directors <clears throat> um, to ask questions and provide comments on the item uh, up for discussion. Um, thank you again, uh, Chief Academic Officer Dr. Dan DeBacker. Um, I'm going to start with Hampson, uh, Director Hampson, and then we'll move down to line in alphabetic order. So, Director Hampson, I'll um, kick it over to you for first questions and comments. Uh, I'm going to pass for now and ask that you come back around to me. Thank you. Okay, Director Harris. I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Director Hersey. I'm good as well, thank you. Okay, Director Mack. I thank you. Um, I have, I believe, three different questions. Um, for clarification, so we've, in this board action, we have the resolution that we're adopting as well as the uh, so temporarily suspending uh, board policy or the provisions in board policy 2415, which are attached. And those provisions that are suspended are stricken through. Um, my first question is about the language of the motion and concern around whether or not it just it says temporarily suspend, but there's no end date stated. Um, and, and I I'd like clarity. At, maybe it's from uh, Mr. Narver on without an end date in the motion. Um, then when does the policy come back in full force? Um, I'm actually going to give uh, Ronald Boy. This is Greg Narver, Chief Legal Counsel. Ronald Boy is on the call. He is the member of the legal team that worked most directly on this resolution. So I'm going to graciously give him the first opportunity to respond to that question. Hi, uh, Ronald Boy here. Um, if you refer to the resolution uh, that is being passed, it indicates in the last, uh, be it further resolved, uh, that the board uh, is indicating that the resolution expires in tandem with WAC 180111, uh, which is July 31st, 2020, and the force of the resolution sunsets on that day. Um, thank you for that. I did see that in the in the resolution, um, but I'm not seeing how that ties to the board policy end date. The 
policy um, attachment is indicated uh, for reference. It's not approval, so it's referencing the sections that the resolution uh, places a, a waiver upon um, so that it is clear to uh, the board and the public and our staff um, the specific portions of the, the policy that that will be waived during this time period. Um, but the actual policy is not being impacted. Um, it's just the, the resolution is waiving those portions for the time period. Okay, great. I appreciate that clarification. So we're adopting the resolution. We're not actually suspending the way the policy and yeah. that it's, it, it has an end date of July 31st, 2020. Yes, that, that's correct. Even though the information also says that, you know, potential other closures, it actually does have an end date. So I just, I wanted to get that into the record and clarified. Um, so thank you for that. The other piece that uh, the resolution talks about and is a little, um, I think it maybe is useful for our knowledge here about uh, juniors and um, the class of 2021. Um, this policy does not, as I read it, apply to any other class other than the current seniors. So if um, students that are in the other grades uh, were looking at incompletes, they wanted to waive credits from this semester, uh, they they currently do not have that opportunity through this action. Is that correct? That is correct. The The emergency rules that were uh, put into place by the State Board of Education um, applied to uh, students of the class of 2020 and earlier. Um, the actions of the state um, did not apply to um, a future class, and I would hope that the 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 steps that OSPI has put in put into place for grading um, on uh, for this semester will will help um, with any potential issues that may arise for future classes. But I would also expect that if there is a an issue that that comes up that. You know, this COVID situation is a an evolving situation, and it may be that that we have future um, state action that would address future classes. But at this point, um, it's just the address earlier. Okay, great. I, I appreciate that clarification. That um, this process will not. Uh, provide the same opportunities the class of 2021 which is actually the first class that has a 24 credit requirement um, and this semester um, uh, is likely to be a massive impact on them um, and so I think we just need to uh, stay aware that we are likely going to need to uh, in the future adopt something uh, to support those students um, and that this action isn't actually covering that. Yeah. So my, thank you. My last question is um, related to the IB provision that's being waived. I'm just kind of a little confused as to why it's specifically being waived from the policy. The language in the policy about IB is I, I guess I I, I, I kind of just don't understand why IB is called out so specifically and then why we're waiving the provisions of um, the IB graduation requirements. I know that Caleb can uh, speak to this. Uh, we had a, a discussion about it, and after the discussion, um, it it definitely made sense. But I'll let Caleb uh, respond. Thank you. 
Hello, this is Caleb Perkins. Um, Director Mack, I don't have much more to offer. Just we were, we wanted to make sure that the the same uh, flexibility for seniors who were in IB programs was available to them. Um, we did work with that. To, um, so that's why those things were, were crossed out. It was just meant to be consistent so they would also have access to the same uh, did it. Um, and for clarity on that, they also, um, a, a student that's in the IB program uh, gets an IB certificate or an IB, what exactly do they get along with their high school graduation certificate? Um, the, the, what they're usually trying to get is an IB diploma. A diploma, uh, that's, okay. So the name is the, the, the diploma. So if they waive credits, are they waiving their ability to get the IB diploma as well? Or does this enable them to waive credits and still earn that diploma? Uh, I believe it's the latter. And I, I am looking through past conversations about this detail just to make sure I have that right. So if uh, I believe it is the latter, but I, I will need to confirm. Okay, it's fine with me if we, we can move on to other directors' questions if you want to circle back on that. Um, that that concludes my current questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Great questions. Director Rankin. Hi, thanks. Um, I, I don't have questions. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Dr. DeBacker and um, to Kayla Perkins for uh, being really quick to, and responsive to get this together and um, for anticipating uh, what the needs of our students are going to be. Um, I know we have a lot of information included in the bar about um, numbers and who's impacted. And um, so I just want to thank them for being super thorough and bringing it to, uh, we agreed in committee last week that, um, you know, to make sure that seniors understand that the support is there for them and we want to get them over the finish line of graduation as they had been planning before this, um, uh, that speed was of the essence to get this up and running so that we can make that, make that happen. So thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Rivera Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions here just for some clarification. Um, I'm trying to figure out, so let's, let's start with near the top, page one. Um, the, the, um, this waiver is for, it says, students in the graduating class of 2020 or earlier. Can you, can somebody clarify what that means to be or earlier? Are we talking about people who would have graduated to 2020, um, or is, I'm, I just want to clarify what that means. Um, Hello, this is Chief DeBacker, and yes, this would be uh, uh, what we would consider a fifth year senior. Who would still be graduating though in 2020, but they're not considered yeah. the class of 2020? Is that what that means? Then? Right. They, they would be considered the class of 2020. Um, they hadn't finished uh, during their uh, first four years, but they were continuing on and were on track to graduate this year. Great, thank you. Okay, um, second question is uh, on page two. There, um, I think it was like the second -ish paragraph, end of the second paragraph. Um, summer term is included in the school year, and students may waive planned summer credit recovery courses if the summer term is canceled due to COVID-19. Um, I'm kind of confused because please. I don't know, is there really a chance summer term would be canceled? Because even spring wasn't canceled so much. We just weren't in the buildings. Um, is there a chance we will not have any summer term? Because I, I think it's, you know, it's, I know maybe it's mincing words, but I just want to make sure there's not some um, fear out there that we won't have an opportunity in the summer for um, recovery courses or summer session. Uh Director Rivera Smith, if I may, uh, Director DeWolf is okay if I chime in. And that's Dr. Absolutely, Perkins. absolutely. Yes. Right, sorry, yes, this is absolutely. Uh, 
Caleb Perkins. Um, that's the language. Uh, it's my understanding that's the language from the State Board of Education wording. Um, they're referring to the school closure. Um, so if they're effectively, if there's an inability for a student to participate in summer school to the fullest extent, as uh, just as is happening with school closure now, then they would be eligible to waive that. It's if we return to summer school as usual, then they would not be able to waive it. That is my understanding of what the state board is allowing us to do with summer. Does that help? Um, yeah, I, I think so. But if that could be clarified somewhere, um, I don't. I mean, I don't know. If it's there's a chance for that at this point, but um, because I, again, like I, I, I think he's clarified it. I think it's okay. Okay, yeah, like I said, my concern was just over the term, some term canceled, because again, that's, I don't know, anyways, I just wanted to, I don't want parents to walk away with um, a lack of clarity on the opportunities that will be available this summer as well. Um, but let me see, okay, so um, I think I have one, I'm scrolling through my, my documents here. Um, there it is. Um, I had a question, come back. Scrolled away from me. <laughs> um, in, I think it's in the resolution. Oh gosh, my computer's being funky and skipping ahead on me. Um, why don't you come back to me? I'm gonna keep digging. I, I, my, my pages are jumping around. Um, I will. Uh, okay, I'll Director Vera Smith. I'll let. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna call in uh, Director Mac. She had another question, so I'll come right back to you. Okay. So, Director mm -hmm. Mac, I'll I'll let you jump in with another question. Director Dewolf, this is Director Hampson. Um, I just had one question. I was had asked you to come back around to me so I can go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I was either you or Director Mack, but if, if you're ready, uh, I'll, I'll let you go and, and Director Mack will go after you and then Director Vera Smith. Yeah, I just wanted to, I appreciate the um, attention in the board action report to the cons associated with providing the waivers. I think it's incredibly important that we do this, and I really appreciate everyone's uh, willingness thus far to support bringing this as quickly as possible to uh, um, intro in action so that we can provide some um, um, some sense of, of assurance to our seniors. Um, but I did appreciate the note about the cons, which are um, possibly starting off uh, their next, um, uh, endeavor behind, and I just wondered um, if you could elaborate on that a little bit, um, uh, Dr. DeBacker. Yeah, the uh, the intention will be that they, um, as the counselors work with each of those individual seniors and go over all of the options that they have in front of them, our, our, our push will be that, uh, for, especially for students who are going on on to post-secondary education, they need to continue their studies through the end of the semester to the extent possible, just so they aren't behind. Um, and so that will that will be one of the things that our counselors will visit with seniors about because they will have some options in front of them, and we will encourage them to stay engaged in learning um, so that they are are not behind as they move on to their post-secondary. Schooling, uh, which in Seattle Public Schools, that's about 80% of our students. And I would hope, uh, this is Director Hampson again, that we would also um, be sure to reach out to uh, at least to state schools and, and uh, other uh, networked institutions to confer with them about um, the prospective needs that our students might have coming in the door. It's not an uncommon um, resource for um, institutions of, of higher ed to provide to particularly those students for this from educational justice to try to ensure their success. And uh, the extent to which we can advocate for that, I think would be uh, critical to the further success of, of this um, bar. Thank you. Can I, this is Director Rankin, can I add something to that? Dr Dr um, I just sure, Director Rankin. wanted to sort of echo the, the question from um, Director Hansen, and just say that um, I appreciate the inclusion of that in this policy because I think uh, it is important to remember for all of our students that you know we we 
the royal we, the state, the whoever, re require certain things of them to graduate, but that it's really incumbent upon them to leave high school with what, you know, whatever they think is coming next. You know, we, we want to ease the burden on them to allow them to meet those requirements, but that also we're still, um, it's still our obligation to provide all of the resources necessary for the students to have the skills and information that they want and need and not just, you know, check their boxes. So I really appreciate that that, that um, point is included so that when students are thinking about through their options, um, they're, they have a, a moment to reflect on like, oh, well, I can just waive that. You know, do they really want to do that or do they have the, um, the ability at this point to say, well, I could waive that, but I really wanted to, you know, explore X in this course, and I'm really going to make sure that I get that done before graduation or before June. So um, just thank you for, for flagging that, and I hope that our, our counselors and educators will, will help um, support that point as well. Thank you, Director Rankin. I'm going to turn it over to Director Mack now. Yes, thank you. Um, I uh, apologize for not catching the previous call, but I appreciate the uh, Director Hampson jumping in and asking that. Um, my question, my sec, my fourth question, I guess that uh, kind of was pinged because of Director Vera Smith's question around summer school. Um, as I read through this, I'm actually a little confused and need a little clarification. This, these waivers only apply to our current seniors. So do we actually have any current seniors that would have been uh, attaining their diploma for 2021 utilizing uh, summer school uh, credits. Director DeWolf, this is Caleb Perkins. Uh, is it okay Dr. if I respond? Dr. Perkins, jump in. Yep, Dr. Perkins, jump, jump right in. Yes, there are uh, seniors that were planning to graduate by the end of August. That's a, traditionally a group that we have in our in our senior cohorts. So, per House Bill 2965, if seniors had a plan in place to either graduate at the end of the semester by meeting credit requirements or they needed the summer uh, the state board has allowed both of those groups to be able to be eligible for the waivers uh, but the, again the assumption is that they're graduating in august and therefore still part of class of the class of 2020. i think that timeline and uh is actually helpful to clarify this resolution uh states the end of july uh, but we're actually impacting and providing waivers to students that would have been graduating or are planning to graduate in August. Um, and therefore, summer school does um, and waiving credits for summer school or that would have been completed during summer school becomes um, an issue if, if needed. Um, so my follow-up question is just to get some clarification either from you, uh, Dr. Perkins, or uh, uh, someone else about what the uh, current planning that the district has around summer school. Um, uh, Superintendent Juno in her, her Facebook Live presentation yesterday said that we will be holding summer school, um, but I'm I wonder if that that message needs some clarification because what summer school typically is for Seattle Public Schools is limited. It's not summer schools of open and available to 54,000 students. Um, so I'm I'd like to get a little bit of clarification about what our expectation is in running the summer school program. How many students is it still primarily dedicated towards? Um, students that need to complete their high school credits. Um, you know, what are the confines of our expectation around summer school? Uh, 
uh, Director Mack, this is Superintendent Juno, and we just had a conversation at cabinet level today about the future of summer school and what's it look like, and there's a lot of planning that's going on, and our plan really is to have a very much more robust uh, summer school than we have in the past. Um, right now, you know, perhaps it's a mix of different type of things that are going on, but we can definitely provide, once that becomes a little more refined, um, some information to the board about summer school. But right now we are planning for summer school. We're planning for more students to be engaged in summer school um, across the spectrum. Uh, well, thank you for that clarification. I think it's helpful to know that we're planning for that. I'm, as a corollary to that, I'm curious to know how we're planning to fund it since we don't typically run school during the summer, but that's a, that's another Question. Thank you for that. Right. But I think that, I mean, it's going to be a good conversation because um, we know that summer school is going to be really a necessary factor for continuous learning for our students, um, that there's going to have to be some acceleration and some interventions that happen during the summer. And so we are working also with Joe Lynn to figure out uh, the funding of that as well. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. I don't have any other further questions. Thank you, President DeWolf. Thank you, Director Mack. Okay, I'm going to return it back to Director Rivera Smith. Could get a couple of questions up. No, actually, yeah. So they were actually pretty covered there. I was going to be about the um, about the opportunity for students to uh, decline the waiver and um, if how that would be explored with them. And I and I know it's in the, it's in the bar there. So it's kind of giving an example of pros and cons. So um, I just wanted to you know just have that assurance that there is a process for them to waive it because for some students it would be beneficial for them to take the courses and gain the instruction and knowledge. I, I just wanted to um, get a little more clarification on that, but everyone's questions pretty much covered that, so I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rivera smith um, And I have no questions at this time as well, um, but I just wanted to, again, um, thank Chief uh, Academic Officer Dr. Dan DeBaker DeBacker and Dr. Perkins for all of your work on this and for really getting this over to us in a really quick turnaround. Um, so I appreciate your efforts and was really grateful that you were able to chat with the CNI committee this week too. So given that that is the end of the discussion, I'm going to call on Ms. Wilson Jones for the vote. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Sorry, I couldn't find my my uh, the right screen. Aye. Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. We will now move to action item number two, BTA three, approval of budget transfer from BTA three program contingency and award construction contract K5118 bid number B0. 12038 to Good News Group Inc. for the Adams Elementary School Fire Sprinkler Upgrades Project. This came to the Operations Committee on March 24th for approval. May I have a motion for this item? This is Director Hampson. I move that this school board, number one, approve the transfer in the amount of $1,026,688 from the BTA3 program contingency to the Adams Elementary School Fire Sprinkler sprinkler upgrades project budget and number two authorize the superintendent to execute construction contract k5118 with good news group inc in the amount of one million one hundred and twenty one thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars including base bid plus washington state sales tax with any minor additions deletions and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the contract second the motion Thank you, Director. Okay, so the item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. 
This item has been updated since introduction, so um, Chief Operations Officer Fred Podesta, could you please brief us on the update? Hello. Um, the updates were merely some words inserted into the equity analysis that um, were just typographical errors. There haven't been any um, substantive changes to the, the board action report. Okay, thank you, uh, Chief Podesta. So now I'm gonna call on um, directors for any comments or questions before we move to the vote. So I'll start with our operations committee chair, Director Mack, and then move alphabetically from there. So Director Mack, uh, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I don't have any uh, questions on this. Appreciate the work as always and the importance of uh, having fire safety sprinkler systems that work in our buildings is incredibly important and glad we're taking this opportunity to move this forward. Okay, thank you, Director Mack. Next up is Director Hampson. No questions for me, thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Harris, over to you. I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Next up is Director Hersey. None for me, thank you. Next up is Director Rankin. Nope, we covered this pretty well in um, committee, so thanks. Awesome, thank you, Director Rankin. Director Devetta Smith. Um, yeah, I do one quick question, just as I think this was covered in committee, but I was I would like to be reminded to have clarification again of how the project um, doubled in size, the process from the cost of it to what was budgeted. Um, I, I guess I, I recall there being a reason, um, but I'm trying to remember and just get clarification for that. Hello, this is uh, Fred Podesta, Chief Operations Officer. The um, Original estimate, this is a BTA3 project, so the original uh, construction cost estimates were from 2014, so there's been significant inflation since then. It's also, um, the project was rescoped to increase the reach of the system and also to um, uh, conceal more of the piping. The original design had a lot of exposed pipe in the building that was deemed, you know, not um, an optimal design. So the scope has increased to enclose um, more of the system than would have been done otherwise. Wonderful. Thank you for that. No further questions. Thank you. And I have no questions on this item, um, but thank you again for joining us, Chief Podesta. So I am going to uh, ask Ms. Wilson Jones for the, the roll call vote. Director Rankin. Director Sorry. Rankin. <laughs> Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Wolf Joan. Okay, now we will move to the introduction item portion of today's agenda. So we'll move to introduction item number one, high school chemistry B instructional materials adoption. This came through the Constru curriculum and instruction committee on April 21st for approval. Um, Dr. Backer, I believe you'll be briefing us. Um, actually, uh, Director DeWolf, this, this is Chief Counsel uh, Greg Narver speaking. Um, uh, we have been having an attorney-client uh, communication series of communications between me and Dr. DeBacker and her team, uh, and I believe we are going to be withdrawing this uh, item for introduction today um, because of the privileged nature of this. I'm not going to uh, discuss the reasons now but there is uh, some additional work that needs to be done. Um, Dr. DeBecker, is that, is that correct, that that's the decision that's been made? 
Yes, uh, Diane DeBacker here. Uh, that is the decision that that's been made. We believe it's in the best interest for the school district at this time. Um, and uh, I apologize to the uh, curriculum instruction committee that you did not know about this in advance. It is uh, something that came to knowledge uh, just within the last hour. And my apologies to President DeWolf as well. Thank you, Dr. DeBacker, and thank you, Chief Counsel Narver. Um, given that news, this item would, is being withdrawn from today's agenda, so we can move to introduction item number two. My only curiosity is, do you have a sense on timing, um, Dr. DeBacker? Yes, uh, timing is we would, if we can um, get it back in front of the Curriculum Instruction Committee um, and and others, uh, we would like to <laughs> at the next uh, board meeting. Okay, and and Chief Chief Narber, Narber um, is there anything we need to do procedurally here, or for the record, on uh, withdrawing this? I don't believe so. I think we have a clear record that it's uh, not being introduced today, and uh, Dr. DeBecker has laid out the next steps, which will be to take it back to the committee. I don't believe any further actions required by the board. Thank you. Appreciate your counsel. Uh, okay. President DeWolf, this is Director Rankin. Can I ask a Hello, question? Hello, Rankin. Hi. Sure. <laughs> um, as long as I can answer it. What? As long as I can answer it, yes. I'm oh, sure no, I'm, I'm just wondering or, or suggesting, um, I guess, or asking if there's a need to, to uh, move more, um, having it come before CNI. I know that the timeline, I, I don't know what the issue is, obviously, but the timeline was a bit of an issue um, in terms of what students can access this semester. Um, so if there is a need to uh, have an additional call of CNI committee or something like that, um, I guess, uh, Dr. DeBacker, please let, like, let's talk about it. See if we can help move it along. Yes, yes, we, we can talk about it. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, something I think that will be easily rectified. Okay, great. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Director Rankin, and thank you, um, Chief DeBecker and, and, and Craig Narver. Um, so, given that, we will move on to introduction item number two uh, approval of new board policy number 3423, Parent Guardian Administration of Marijuana for Medical Purposes and amending ex existing board policy number 5201, drug-free schools, community, and workplace. And this came through the operations committee on April 8th for approval. So now I'm gonna ask senior counsel, uh, senior, se excuse me, senior general counsel, Ronald Boy, to um, provide a brief briefing to this board. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director DeWolf. Um, in Last year's legislative session, a new law was passed which uh, provided the opportunity for uh, minors who suffer from a terminal or debilitating uh, medical condition to uh, and who possess a recognition card to have their parent or guardian um, who's indicated on their recognition card to provide medical um, marijuana infused products uh, to them on, at, on a school setting. Uh, so on school property or on a school field trip, um, on a school field, on a school bus, um, things like that. And as part of the new law that was passed, um, it requires that school boards uh, develop a policy to provide this um, carve out of our uh, of our anti-drug policy for the school district. And this policy is in response to that, that law. And it provides the opportunity for a, a situation where if we do have a student uh, that's suffering from a terminal or debilitating uh, medical condition whose doctor has determined uh, that they could benefit from a marijuana infused product, that it does allow for the opportunity or guardian to come onto school property, uh, provide that product uh, to the student, and then 
after the, the, the student has been given the product, the parent is required to remove the, the marijuana infused product from school property. Um, so the only time that the um, marijuana infused product will be on school property is at the time of um, providing it to the student um, and it's taken off um, after that. With this situation, um, no school staff will be involved in handling the marijuana infused product. Um, it, but the policy allows for the, the parent or guardian to come onto property or on a school bus or at a sporting event or a field trip and provide it to a student. Now, are there any questions? Hey, thank you, Senior Counsel, Senior General Counsel Ronald Boy. I am going to call on directors in the order of uh, alphabetical order, but I will start with Director Mack, who is our Operations Committee Chair. So, uh, Director Mack, over to you first. Yes, um, thank you. We had very robust discussion about this in committee and cross referenced with other policies that. Uh, we needed to ensure we're not being impacted by this change and that uh, the appropriate updates were being uh, taken in the appropriate policies and procedures, et cetera, and uh, uh, grateful for the work that was done and the comprehensive nature of it. Um, look forward to moving it forward. Thank you. D Director Matt, can I just ask a clarifying question while you're still on is, can you share a little bit of background why we just came forward for approval as compared to consideration? Uh, because of the um, robust nature of the discussion and the, uh, you know, it's a state requirement that we develop a policy around it. Um, and uh, we uh, very thoroughly checked to see whether or not our other policies around medication on school grounds, et cetera, were impacted. Um, and uh, we felt uh, confident that um, we've uh, addressed the state law appropriately um, and cross reference with our existing policies uh, robustly. Um, there, there, there weren't any uh, remaining consideration questions uh, from committee members. Okay. Does that answer your question? That, that was helpful. Yes, I, I think just especially as this is intro, I want to make sure we have as much on the uh, on the record around. Okay. The background, so I appreciate that. Uh, yes. I will now move it over to Director Hampson. Uh, the only question that I would have is, uh, is this the extent of what state law allows in terms of the parent access? I mean, the parent having to bring it and then remove it. Is that limited by state law or is that the result out of state law public schools policy development? Yes, the the state law is very prescriptive in the way that um, this is handled on in a school setting. So the what you're seeing in the policy is a mirror of the requirements that are set forth uh, by the law, and we don't have the opportunity to um, to make it less restrictive than what it is. Okay, thank you. That's all from me. Thank you, Director Hampson. All right, now I'll move to Director Harris. No questions, but a comment. I never thought that I would live long enough to see medical marijuana be a compliant issue for our school. I'm done. <laughs> thank you, Director Harris. Uh, Fine point indeed. All right, Director Hersey, you're next. No questions for me. Thank you. Next up is Director Rankin. Uh, nope, I don't have any questions. We did have a um, uh, a lot of opportunity to talk about this in committee and pretty, uh, as Director Max said, pretty thorough. Um, discussion do you, so do you have any highlights to share from that for for our public um yeah i mean the main the main thing that we asked is sort of related to what director harris just mentioned um or, or sorry sorry director hampson um about uh, the parents bringing it on um and and that led 
up to some other questions about uh, our our other policies for for medication and um, uh, basically that the the distinction is you know you need a medical marijuana card but it, it's not it doesn't come from a pharmacy um, and so it's not expected that a school nurse would be um, handling medical marijuana and and also about the the fact that medical marijuana and then anti drug policies um, or uh, and then anti drug policies medical marijuana or marijuana itself floats overlaps between the two it was a bit of a Venn, Venn diagram situation <laughs> um, set to in, in order to assure ensure access to a student who um, has the documented need for it um, but to basically we can't ask school staff to administer um, uh, something that contains a substance that's not supposed to be on campus in other forms uh, so that was sort of the the extent of the conversation was was what makes this medication different from other medications and that's that's pretty much where it fell is that it's a uh, it's sort of its own entity in terms of of uh, medication which of course goes into a whole legacy and history of stigma and and substance and all kinds of stuff but uh, that was what we settled on was that basically the state is uh, the state is allowing for students to have access to it um, but restricting who can handle it and so our policy reflects is consistent with that Thank you very much, Director Rankin. Okay, Director Rivera Smith, up next. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was also in, at the um, operations committee meeting. This was discussed. Um, for clarification, I do not sit on the operations committee, but I do attend their meetings, um, as I do the other committees that I'm not on. <laughs> um, but I, uh, it was definitely a, a pretty lengthy discussion we had about this. Bar um, started with needing the addition of the policy number it was referring to, which I see has been added now. It is board policy 5201. Thank you um, for having that added. Uh, we also talked about just, you know, again, like Dr. Rickman mentioned, this is to comply with the new state law um, and only parents can bring administer. I asked if there was a possibility for a backup parent to be listed that in case the primary um, administering parent could not be available for that if there was an opportunity to have a backup listed and that sounds like currently cannot be done because that is not part of the state law um so we couldn't allow for that right now i asked if they were required to show their card each time they came in to administer and um that has that will be part of procedure um i don't it sounded like um they don't have to show it each time they are coming in, but there is going to be a tracking system in place because those cards do expire every six months. So we wouldn't want to assume that somebody's card is still valid when it in fact has expired. So there's going to be a tracking system in place so that we can know if that is current. And I also asked if teachers or staff were going to be getting the same kind of allowance to use medical marijuana on campus. And that is not currently in this um, in the state law right now. So. That's not what we're, um, Ronald Boy said. We were, that was not in the works at this time, but we may be looking into that. Um, anyway, that was um, what I have down <laughs> for that meeting's discussion. And this definitely had a lot of thought and discussion going to it. So I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, President DeWolf, if I could just uh, also say this is Director Mack. I really appreciate the thoroughness and engagement of all of the board directors in asking all the questions and um, also in particular with uh, Ms. Rivera-Smith having such thorough notes. Um, appreciate bringing and uh, Director Rankin's also um, adding to the conversation. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, helping us dot the I's and cross the T's. Thank you, Director Mack. Um, my questions, uh, Senior General Counsel Ronald Boy is um, one is around the bar. There wasn't any an equity analysis done, so I'm wondering if that can be done 
between now and the um, adoption. And my curiosity is, did we not do it because it's just um, aligning with state law? Um, those are my questions. Yeah, I would, I would be happy to do that. And we can, uh, I can get that done this week and have it added to the bar for uh, board act. And yeah, that's that's correct because it is a legal compliance issue. It wasn't done, but but happy to and address it. The other thing I wanted to just make sure was completely clear that in addition to this approving a policy, there's also an edit to policy mm -hmm. 5201, mm -hmm. which I failed to mention um, originally, which provides a carve out to drug free schools, community and workplace to um, allow for this to take place. Um, and I think on that point, is is this new policy 3423 um, administration of marijuana for medical purposes, is this um, the policy that we have uh, that we utilize in collaboration with WASDA? Yes, we okay. started with the WASDA model um, okay. and we changed it to I think more reflect our, our style um, of policy and provide a little bit more clarity um, from their wording, um, but it is basically the foundation is the laws to model. Okay. Okay. Um, and the only other thing I had, and this is maybe just a little bit nitpicky, but I feel like the student benefit section, um, or maybe it's even in the research, uh, I would imagine that there's, um, I know it's it's obviously to be aligned with state law, but I would imagine that there's more compelling student benefits. So if you felt like you could in the in the time between then and the adoption, I think having equity analysis and a and a really strong student benefit just to again, I know it's in alignment with state law, but to also clarify that um, we affirm it as a as a as a tool that um, students and families need um, to ensure they're able to um, participate in a high quality public education. Yeah, yeah, happy to make those additions. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, next, seeing no more questions, unless any other directors had any more questions about this topic, I wanna make sure we certainly can um, have any more that come up. Okay, hearing none, we will now move to introduction item number three. BEX-5 award contract P1721 for construction project management services to CBRE. Here for the local Lincoln High School phase two project on April 8th for approval. Mr. Podesta, I believe you'll be briefing us. Yes, hello, uh, Chief Operations Officer Fred Podesta. Um, this board action authorizes uh, execution of a contract for construction project management services, a lead firm to oversee the overall project at uh, Lincoln High School, uh, the construction management services, approximately $1.4 million contract, and the overall project is budgeted as approximately $29 million. Uh, directors, I'm sure will recall that we opened uh, Lincoln High School last fall, and most of the work was done on the main building. Um, this project allows for seismic improvements to be completed at the east buildings on campus, which were constructed in 1959. It also um, creates improvements and renovations to spaces for career and technical education, um, the theater, the Performing Arts Center, and uh, the gymnasium. And it's a fairly straightforward project and it's a continuation of um, work that has gone on over the last several years. And that concludes my comments. Thank you, Chief Podesta. Okay, so now we will move uh, to directors for questions and comments. We'll start with uh, Director Mack, who is the Operations Committee Chair. Thank you, President DeWolf. Um, uh, I think that Mr. Podesta's briefing was uh, relatively complete. I just want to, uh, I think, add for context that this phase two um, portion of the project is in effect um, a, uh, 
change from what was originally proposed to raise those buildings, uh, um, and that was seen to be too expensive and challenging, and so those existing buildings are, are being uh, provided uh, the seismic upgrades that are necessi necessary for student safety as well as um, the other modifications that are being made uh, to make them usable, and that these spaces are not only um, present and available to um, the high school students at, at Lincoln, but they serve as uh, the primary auditorium um, for many of the middle schools uh, and other elementary schools in the region that do not have a uh, actual auditorium space. So uh, I'm looking forward to this uh, project uh, going forward and uh, supporting both the safety of the building for students and um, and accessibility for uh, the other programs listed as well as CTE, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Okay, now we'll start alphabetically with the remaining directors. So we'll start with Director Hampson. Uh, no questions from me, thank you very much. Thank you, Director Hampson. Next will be Director Harris. I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Next up is Director Hersey. None for me, thanks. Next up is Director Rankin. Um, no, I don't have questions, but I wanted to highlight something that was discussed when this came through the Operations Committee, um, which is in addition to what Director Mack was talking about with uh, having the theater auditorium space available for um, other schools in the area that don't have that space. Uh, that's something that we discussed was, um, or something that I would like to look into further is uh, the, to me, very exciting possibility of a new theater arts space um, and how, as in all industries, technology uh, in theater arts, in lighting and sound and uh, all of those things changes very quickly and uh, the exciting possibility for our students and potential ex uh, CTE opportunity that we have here that um, I would really like us to look at more as the project goes forward. That's it. Thank you, Director Rankin. Okay, next we'll move to Director Rivera Smith. Hi, yeah, I'll echo uh, what Director Rankin just mentioned that we did discuss um, the, um, the potential for using, utilizing that improved space for CTE. Um, courses, which you know, this would be, I think, would be awesome. I, I the Lincoln High School does offer a theater tech class, which will surely utilize that. My son actually just took that class this last semester and really enjoyed it. And um, having that and having those improvements will definitely add to that experience. And it would be great to um, spread that experience around to other students in other schools if, if we can get a CT program in that facility. Um, there is CT classes. Part of that wing is uh, other CTE classes that are there. I, I'm trying to remember what they're for. They're for food or medical. I, I, I'm not positive, but um, anytime we have an opportunity to expand that program, um, always up for conversations on that. So looking forward to having that with Director Rankin and anyone else. Um, I'm not seeing much else was discussed at that aside from those possibilities at that meeting, but um, that pretty much covers it. Thank you, no further questions. Thank you, Director Nevada Smith. Okay, and I have no questions at this time for this item as well. So we will now move on to the final introduction item for today. Introduction item number four, <coughs> excuse me, BEX4 award construction contract P5139 to Wayne's Roofing Inc. for the West Seattle High School roof replacement project. This came to the operations committee on April 8th for approval. Mr. Podesta, I believe you'll also be briefing us again on this one. Yes, this project is a roof replacement for West Seattle High School. The existing um, roof was installed in, uh, 2000, uh, in, in 2001, and there have been spot repairs to the roof in 2017. Um, the tile roof at the building is 
part of uh, the building's landmark status. So this is, uh, you know, a, a fairly broad area and somewhat complex project um, for a roof project, but we uh, expect it to go. Uh, since the repairs were made just a few years ago in uh, isolated areas, we think we have a pretty good understanding of the roof conditions and the roof systems in place. So we're expecting this to be a fairly straightforward piece of work. Understood. Thank you, uh, Chief Podesta. Now we will move to questions and comments from directors. And again, we'll start with our operations committee chair, Director Mack. Uh, no comments at this time. Just grateful uh, that uh, this project is moving forward. Wonderful. Okay, next up is Director Hampson. Nothing for me, thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. Next up is Director Harris. I'm good, thank you. Awesome, and next up we'll have Director Hersey. None for me, thank you. Uh, Director Rankin. Nope. I'm um, excited to see this move forward. I remember a few years ago, a student guest on the dais from uh, West Seattle High School talking about putting buckets in the hallways to catch rain water. So it's great that this is going to move forward. Thank you, Director Rankin, and thank you for the institutional memory. Next up is Director Rivera-Smith. Sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't get it unmuted. Um, no, <laughs> yeah. This, yeah, this is this is this is exciting to get done. Obviously, um, the apparently um, from a discussion we learned that the it's a 15 year lifespan for this type of roof, which uh, went in in 2001. So time to replace that and get our kids a nice dry roof. Um, thank you very much. That's all for me. Director Duell, for you on mute. That's so funny. There I was, just all the way starting my next section. Thank you. Uh, it is now 2.17 p.m., so we will now move to the board comments section of the agenda. Again, we'll move alphabetically. Uh, given that we have time. I uh, just encourage you to keep it brief, but uh, we do have until three. And the only other thing I was going to say is we, we will be breaking into an executive session at the conclusion of this regular meeting, and we will go into executive session. And then after that is done, we will come back to the regular board meeting and adjourn. So at this time, we'll start with board comments, and we'll begin with Director Hampson. Hi, thank you. I want to use my time today to talk about uh, my support for uh, a, a letter to um, and, and a, um, an action and effort um, with our uh, state governor um, that was started by One America to support our undocumented uh, families throughout Washington State. Uh, we definitely have a, um, a large number of um, students in Seattle Public Schools that either themselves are undocumented or, or their parents are undocumented. Um, and I think it's, a, it's real, we have seen over and over again the effort upon, on the part of our administration federally to uh, remove any potential support during this COVID crisis, uh, these families. And I know I've gotten numerous reports um, from uh, families in South Park, all the way up to North Seattle, uh, where students are, families are are worried. They're um, uh, in need of services and supports, and uh, are and sometimes even refusing the tech support that we're offering because of of concerns with the impact that that might have um, on their discoverability. And um, so I'm grateful to, we, we don't, uh, I had explored with um, 
Chief Legal Counsel Narver, the possibility of bringing a resolution forward. Uh, and were that a possibility, I would have liked to have done that um, with my fellow uh, board members to show support um, as it is under our current guidance and uh, OPMA requirements. It is not either essential or um, uh, I forget, uh, or routine. Um, and as such, I want to indicate my own support for that letter, which uh, I will just say can be found on the um, One America um, website and would encourage others to um, uh, take a look at that. There is a letter that folks can sign as an individual um, and which I will be doing um, myself and um, just want to raise the, the topic to elevate the um, the need for support for our undocumented families and students uh, when our other systems are, are failing them. And the specific requests from the uh, for the governor are for fiscal support that would be provided through our partner CBOs, many of whom we work with very closely here in Seattle to support our students. Um, and that's all from me at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. Um, thank you for, for elevating that. Um, so I'm going to now turn it over to Director Harris. Well, uh, Director Hampson, you've got my signature and support in a big way, as well as uh, STTSA President Manuela Sly. I couldn't agree more, and uh, you don't want me to get started about the uh, person residing in the White House. Uh, with respect to my update, I am reading along and reaching out along with the rest of you all. I will try to figure out how to use Zoom or Team Contact to have a community meeting. And big props to Director Rivera Smith, who has already done so. And I'll be calling you for technical assistance. Um, but frankly, most of what I can tell. Uh, our constituents is what uh, we've been putting out there on a daily basis. These are extraordinary and unique times, um, and I don't like it, but it's where we're at, and we need to stay safe, and I miss you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Next up is Director Hersey. Thank you. Um, as we settle in with online learning, most of us um, giving full knowledge that there are many of our families in our district who have not been able to access uh, technology or internet. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to uh, all of our district staff, whether it be at the cabinet level or our education uh, partners in the classroom and SEA. Um, this is an incredibly difficult lift. As I say, you know, from my perspective as a teacher, not only providing tech support to families on a regular basis, but also figuring out how do we how do we get our kids to the end of the year, right? So just, you know, recentering our focus um, when times get difficult and the advocacy uh, is thick that we are in a place to where we have great privilege in the sense that we still have the opportunity to make change and to provide in times um, like these when, when you know we really have the responsibility to rise to the challenge. So just a huge thank you to everybody in our district and across King County for everything that they've been doing. I do want to highlight um, specifically our partners in the Somali community and the East African community who are really struggling during this time, not only with language barriers, but also access. Um, I've received a number of calls and emails from those partners around um, students who we definitely identify as furthest away from educational justice, still struggling to figure out what is the solution to receiving a computer or what is the um, solution for internet and how can the district you know, be a partner in that? And we are doing those things. I don't want to discredit that in the least, um, but now turning our attention to filling the cracks 
and identifying those um, individuals and families and students and children in our various communities um, that are still feeling unsafe. So really digging in and trying to bring as many people into this uh, this new normal as possible. Um, so I know that we are working toward uh, a couple of community calls with um, various affinity groups and various um, ethnic-based organizations. Um, and I just want to you know throw that out there. As those things get scheduled, they will be promoted heavily. And if you are on the call and you know of a family that needs support, in any way, shape, or form, please do not hesitate to ask or reach out to um, your principal, your educator, even your board director. Um, we're here to help, and thank you. Look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you, Director Hersey. Next up is Director Mack. Yes, thank you. Um, I think I'll first take the opportunity to give a little bit of update um, uh, for fellow board members as well as the general public around the work that's been going on in the operations committee. Um, as you can see from the agenda items, we today we uh, have been continuing to work. We also uh, had our last meeting on the 27th a couple days ago. Yes, a couple days ago, uh, where we reviewed the schematic designs for uh, the phase two part of Magnolia, as well as um, Co Elementary, and uh, got a uh, written update from staff, as well as verbal presentation around uh, the planning that's going on for the start of school for next year um, in light of the uh, current environment and situation um, and appreciate uh, staff bringing those um, those updates to us to discuss and uh, so that we can know that we are looking at the different um, potential variabilities and that staff is considering to uh, make plans around how to manage uh, potential solutions um, for the start of school. And at the same time, we're continuing to do the work that needs to be done in order to um, open school uh, in September. Um, our next operating operations committee meeting will be on May 14th, but prior to that, we actually have three different board work sessions um, that uh, will be full board work sessions. On May 5th, the uh, ca semi-annual capital programs annual report and the annual enrollment report and capacity evaluation work session on May 6th, the student and community workforce agreement. And then on May 7th, um, we have the student assignment transition plan and boundaries conversations. Um, I'll note that uh, because of the current in, uh, situation, the uh, CMP, the, the capacity enrollment and facilities master planning advisory committee has uh, been delayed and the community conversations around potential boundary changes and student assignment impacts um, have not been as robust uh, because of the current environment uh, but we'll be uh, talking at that point to see where uh, there are some uh, potential issues that we may need to address and um, the CMP is uh we're hoping to uh go ahead and launch and launch virtually uh, we're making plans to to do that um my understanding is that the bex bta uh, oversight committee meetings are also going to continue um but in a virtual uh, uh method uh may 8th is their next meeting so over the next few weeks we actually have quite a bit of work going on related to operations. Um, I'll also note that the impact of the bridge closure, uh, the West Seattle bridge closure um, uh, on transportation is being evaluated um, by staff and considered. Because uh, obviously, they, if we open in the fall, uh, buses um, are going to be um, impacted by that. and. 
um, staff is working on those issues and, and um, seeing what we need to do to plan um, to be effective. Um, from a personal standpoint, for my my comments tonight, I just I just want to say to everyone that as a parent experiencing uh, this balancing act and transition to uh, remote learning, um, I share frustrations um, as well as accolades to uh, student to uh, educators and building leaders on uh, uh, pulling all of these uh, things together that need to get pulled together in order to provide the support and services to our students. Um, and uh, you know, I appreciate that we're 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 continuing to work through all of those issues. And I, I want, I do believe that district staff um, and our educators, as we are working through what works, what doesn't work. Um, and you know where, maybe where there's gaps in uh, technology, et cetera, that that we are we're going to continue make improvements over time. Um, one of the issues that's been brought to my attention that I uh, know you know needs some assistance is you know the challenge we have around what's available on our district laptops in terms of apps and. Um, programs and, and so forth, and whether or not um, educators are suggesting apps and other programs that aren't um, accessible. Um, and I know that that issue has been raised with district staff, and we have policies around um, those things, and that we'll be continuing to work on making sure that um, all of these things are accessible to students um, as they should be. Um, and I really appreciate Director Hersey talking about filling in the cracks um, because uh, you know we we need to continue to focus on on doing so, figuring out where where we need to um, make improvements to support students. And um, I appreciate all of our staff, the district level, um, and at the building. Um, continuing to uh, do our best to um, provide educational services to our students um, during this time and continuing to improve. Thank you. That concludes my comments. Thank you, Director Mack. Director Rivera Smith. He's skipping me. I was even ready to unmute. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I. <laughs> Oh, Director Rinkin, I'm sorry. I mean, yes, Director Rinkin. I don't really care. I don't care about that order. Please but, go. Sorry. Well, you. Okay. So this is Director Rankin. Um, and I, I just, uh, I guess as a general comment, I'm sure like uh, everybody else out there, the longer this goes, you know, some things are getting easier and some things are getting harder and some days are good and some days are bad. And, um, all, all that we can do is the best that we can do. So uh, I guess for like transparency and <laughs> um, solidarity, I, I want to share that yesterday, was that yesterday? I can't even, can't even remember what day it was. Um, uh, we had the opportunity as a board to attend a uh, webinar. We were supposed to have a conference, a, the COSBOC conference, Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color. We were going to have the opportunity to participate in a three-day long conference um, in person that of course was canceled because of COVID, but we did have, have the opportunity to attend a webinar and, um, and, and that was really great. Uh, it was oversubscribed very uh, rightly so because it was really good content and good presentation. Um, and so there was a moment of limbo where we weren't sure if, if uh, I got, you know, the zoom, the Zoom link and I wasn't, or Teams link, and I wasn't sure if um, I was going to be let in or not. And some, anyway, somehow during all of that, this is the for for uh, solidarity part. I completely missed uh, one of my kids' math uh, online calls with his math teacher. Just completely, completely, totally forgot about it. Um, and it's 
it's going to be okay. <laughs> I wish that I had not forgotten, but like all that we can do is the best that we can do. So I just wanted to share that, um, that, uh, just give yourself grace and forgiveness and, and we're all just, we're all just doing what, what we can to get to the next point. Um, so, uh, I, want to also um, share my support for the letter that Director Hansen brought up um, for our undocumented families and community members. Um, it's, it's just super important. I mean, it, it's really, it's frustrating and yet understandable <laughs> that um, fear of disclosing documentation status would uh, is, is keeping families and kids from accessing services. Um, so I, I really, really hope that uh, we can all support that and um, and make sure that families have what they need right now. Um, it, as a broader statement and direct, uh, connected to what uh, Director Hersey was talking about, um, you know, our staff from the school, you know, school staff, building leaders, district staff, the amount of work that has happened in the last six weeks to turn around from being an in-person, in-building system to a remote system is really astonishing. And I, I just want to keep making sure that, you know, newspaper articles are going to focus on what's not happening or what maybe didn't happen as quickly as people wanted it to. Um, and the questions that are going to come up and the emails that we get are going to be about things that are not happening or that people are not seeing. But I just want to highlight the incredible amount of things that are happening. And a lot of uh, questions that we tend to get are um, sort of will sometimes be accompanied by the statement, well, I'm not asking for me, but I'm worried about the families who X, Y, Z. And a lot of times in the history of this district past and recent the answer has been like oh it looks like nobody thought about that let's let's see about it what i have noticed in the current crisis is that when we have families who are relatively well taken care of and have what they need when they say oh, i'm not asking for me i'm asking for xyz families there is actually a tremendous amount of work and um, attention being dedicated to our families for this from educational justice not to say it's perfect not to say everybody has what they need but um you know i've gotten a lot of questions about language access and you know services for students experiencing homelessness and it's from people who are not part of that population and um and so and they said well i just haven't heard about it well, you haven't heard about it because you don't need that service. So you're not the first person to be alerted that it is happening. Um, so I appreciate, really appreciate concern and people reaching out to ask about those things. Um, but I also just want to kind of state that, you know, um, students that are uh, covered by McKinney Vento, uh, students that have our highest um, highest the 600 students that have our highest uh, social emotional behavioral health needs have been individually contacted and um, you know there's so many limitations right now is what can actually happen remotely but um, I'm really uh, proud to know and be part of part of the work and um, be able to have the conversations and, and want to just elevate that in a time of crisis when things are happening so quickly, you know, just doing a thing is hard enough, but doing a thing and then also broadcasting it or announcing it is, is extra work that's not happening right now. Um, so I just, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the extraordinary amount of behind the scenes sort of things that are happening. And I hope that we can elevate some of that work uh, more going forward. Um, just like the really awesome uh, nutrition services uh, video that came out last week, I think. Um, it was really great. It just showed all of this sort of uh, seemingly invisible work that's happening, that there's just a ton of that. So, um, uh, and then the, 
in terms of internet access, food access, health, housing, all of these things that we take care of at the school level, I just want to highlight the need for um, other government entities <laughs> for us to advocate to and receive the support of and join in solidarity with and support of our families um, in having those things. It's great that SPS is providing hotspots. SPS is, to, is connecting with, um, inter- is trying to connect families with internet providers with low cost services. It is awesome that we are doing that. And the responsibility to ensure equitable access to things like that goes so far beyond just the school system that I'm kind of, I guess, making the public call for everybody in our communities um, to step up and demand that these things become more equitable and available. Um, I want to say thank you to uh, members of the NAACP Youth Council. We got a bunch of um, really great, thoughtful, detailed emails to the board uh, before this meeting that just help remind us to center ourselves um, in terms of you know, accessibility is one thing, but we also need our, our content and our teaching right now online to be engaging and to be relevant um, to our students. Um, and also the importance that they stated about wanting to really make communication with their teachers easier and communication with each other, which goes back to what um, Director Mack was saying about the different apps. There's some, this district supported, uh, district supported devices can't all, you know, see videos on YouTube or some other things, which, and I know YouTube is a big kind of internet safety issue, but I'm hoping that we can keep figuring out ways to make all of this learning and content more accessible and to make uh, make it easier for kids to connect with each other. Um, special education services and support are supposed to be going on starting this week, so I'd really like to hear from families how that's going and um, if they've heard from their teachers and then um, lastly, I want to give a special shout out to, well, all of our educators, but in particular right now, our librarians who are um, uh, just going above and beyond trying to connect with students and keep them engaged in reading and have conversations with them over group chats about what they're reading, what's exciting to them. And honestly, in the case of my uh, the, t- the librarian at my kids school um having a 45 minute online library lunch where fourth and fifth graders literally just told her what they were doing what they were reading what they ate and she just listened to all of it and told them how great it was and how much she missed them and it's just hugely impactful and um really speaks to the values of our district and the things that are important right now so thank you sps librarians especially miss leland That's it for me. Thank you, Director Rankin. Okay, now officially over to my colleague, Director Rebecca Smith. (laughs) Thank you very much. Um, I'll definitely want to start. I want to start by um, inviting Director Harris. You are most welcome to join me for my um, upcoming Zoom meeting. I would love to have you there. Um, Everybody, it is this Saturday, 1 to 3 p.m. on Zoom. The link is available on the SBS calendar. Um, If anyone wants to join, I can have, I guess, up to two more directors and without having a quorum. So uh, let me know if you want to be there. Um, I also want to speak in support of the creation of relief funds to support our undocumented families and students. Um, As Dr. Hampson spoke of, that that is... um, the fear of discovery and removal is a very real fear in our communities, and um, as the petition um, states, undocumented immigrants are uniquely at risk. Undocumented immigrants and their families were completely excluded from the $2 trillion relief package Congress passed last month and aren't eligible for unemployment insurance, even though providing economic stability to all workers is essential to ending this public health crisis. So, again, I hope that my fellow board members will all join in on signing onto that petition. Um, and um, I will be posting the URL to my um, my director Facebook page, which, speaking of which, um, in my effort to be as transparent and accessible to families as possible, I have been using that page to recap my thoughts, share what my activities are, what meetings I'm holding, um, what meetings I'm going to, and that is on Facebook. Um, you can do search for me, um, Lisa Arifata-Smith, director. Um, 
last week, I, I followed up uh, my affirmative vote at our April 20th special board meeting regarding high school grading with a really long post <laughs> to my to that page. I didn't actually expect it to be that long, but I'm not going to read it. Don't worry. Um, according to Facebook, it's a 12-minute read, so I'm not going to do that here. But, but I do want to touch on just um, some points of it, mostly the beginning and the end. And that would be to state that when I was campaigning for school board, I, I, I try to be very honest with people and often told them that when I'm on the board, you might not always agree with how I vote, but I will always want you to at least know why I voted that way. Um, so I followed that up with a very long uh, um, <laughs> exposition about how the bar made it through our board and um, about my comments at the meeting and concerns and what was shared there. And as everybody knows, um, the, that temporary um, A's or incompletes policy was approved. And I ended the piece by saying, if there's one thing we heard a lot of on Monday, it was that nothing's perfect, which is hard to argue with. It sounds like something any reasonable person would say, and even the pragmatic side of me wants to just drop my shoulders and give a slow But I threw out my crutches a long time ago. The fact is the acceptance of imperfection should not equal acceptance that our students deserve a less than perfect system. I don't think, we need to downplay our decisions by saying that, by comparison, they're as imperfect as everything else. The choices I'll make as a board member aren't likely to get any easier, but I will stand by them, knowing that their imperfections aren't consolations, but chances to rise to the challenge. So <laughs> I, will, I will continue to post thoughts on, um, on activities of the board and my activities specifically. Don't, I don't want to ever speak for anybody else. Any of my other board members, um, you all have your own pages to do that, and I hope you do, and I will be continuing to. Um, I also want to echo appreciation for our teachers and families who, you know, I don't think any either group is more stressed than the other. It's pretty equal. Uh, many of our parents are teachers, many of our teachers are parents, and we got to remember that because it's, it's hard to step back and, and remove yourself from a situation, and, and I wish I'd remember that you don't know other people's struggles. Like we we know ours, but we don't actually know everyone else's struggles. So it, sometimes we need to remember that and realize that there are there are, there are things we can't you know we can't assume. But we're all doing our best. We we can we can assume that our teachers are there for our students to the best and doing what they can. Um, I I thank you for everybody who was sharing grace and sharing patience. Um, I, you know, I'm trying to do that. I, I also you know, I have two students in the system and they have, you know, a total of 12 teachers. So um, I'm right there too, but we are, we are working hard as a district to provide the best educational opportunities and activities we can. And again, um, thank you to all of our educators and our central office staff and board members for all the outreach that has been done and will continue to be done through this process. I have no further comments. Thank you, Director Rivera Smith. Um, I have just a few comments today and then we can move into our executive session. Um, the first one I have is um, after the A and incomplete policy came through and or even while it was in development, we had a number of e emails come in. Um, not necessarily uh, a lot or a ton, but there were there were a handful of the emails that have come in prior and then since we made the decision. And I think there were a, a good many of them that, that um, the sentiment that I was reading in the email was something of, you know, if most of our kids are being served right now, then, you know, we, we need to keep moving. We need to keep doing everything because the majority is being served. And I think um, what we have been uh, relentless and unapologetic in our commitment to is not leaving any kids behind and especially not during this time. And so I'm really grateful for the work of the district and our A and complete policy because I, I truly believe that does not leave any kids behind. And I'm really proud of us using our racial equity lens. I also um, want to uh, at least endorse or affirm or however I can let you know um, that I uh, am absolutely um, interested in being a part of the letter that you mentioned, um, Director Hampson. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I, I, however we can be helpful, please let me know. Um, I think the, uh, another point that uh, just came up from Director Hersey, um, and I just really want to underscore it, is that I don't think a lot of us probably on this call even or even if there's anybody listening, um, understand the true gravity of what kids and families who are saying no to technology because they fear for their life or ice are going through. And I think it would be a really important exercise to really ground ourselves in 
the stories and experiences of, of our students and families furthest from educational justice and to realize the, the, the difficult choices that some families are having to make um, when having to weigh their safety and their education. And so um, it's just really important for us to make sure we're really grounding in our students and families furthest from educational justice to make sure our, our decisions um, are being true to our values. Um, I also think uh, I was really grateful for Director Rankin's comment about our, our internet and our Wi-Fi. I think that is a definitely an issue bigger than the school district, and I would call on uh, all of our partners at, at this, the city, the county, and the state at the government level to be really creative uh, over the course of the next few months and the next legislative session um, to, to really figure out a way that we can get um, equitable and broadband internet access across this whole state so no one um, is, de is denied um, having that. Um, the internet is an important tool not only for education, but also for families and, and jobs. And so I think that there's a real compelling case to make now that we've seen the inequity inequities of the system and that really no students um, should, all students should have Wi-Fi as well as their families, especially during the academic school year. And so be calling on those leaders to, to really be creative. Um, and then lastly, I just want to end with a letter. Um, Director Hampson, Superintendent General and myself wrote a letter to our tribal partners, including um, the chair of the Muckleshoot and the Squamish Nations, Jason Elkins, and Letter Forsman. And so I wanted to read that letter today and just end with that, and then we can move into our executive session. And I'm just going to read it in the frame of the, the, the letter being sent first um, to the Honorable Chairman Leonard Forsman. Dear Honorable Chairperson Leonard Forsman, Thank you for your tremendous leadership during this health crisis. Taking care of your citizens and your communities, taking care of your citizens and community during this pandemic is a weighty responsibility that requires consideration of so many complex issues while ensuring your people stay safe. We appreciate all that you are doing to help Indian country emerge from this crisis stronger and more resilient than ever. As indigenous leaders of the state's largest school district, we recognize the critical importance of making connections and working together with our tribal nations during this time. We also to continue to center our decision making on our students of color furthest from educational justice, including Native students. We realize the importance of our ancestral memory and tribal traditions as we navigate this situation. We know that our organization as guests to the traditional lands on which we are guests must continue to build upon the values, history and contemporary experience of the Coast Salish people. Since COVID-19 first impacted our region, Seattle Public Schools immediately began working to create new systems, responses, and practices that could support our most vulnerable and still serve all 53,000 students. We created 26 meal sites across the city, meal delivery by bus, 18 childcare sites, laptop and device distribution, mental health resources, and launched remote learning. As part of our remote learning educational service, our district put together many resources for our students, including educational video lessons ranging from five minutes to half an hour on topics such as English language arts, math, physical education, science, music, art, since time. We would be honored to provide these lessons, video lesson resources to you, to your educational organization for your for use in your community. We all we all we can also work with your education department to provide access to our packets that align to these video lessons that can be printed for home use by your families. Additionally, in the coming weeks, we'll be hosting a Q&A with our partners at the Seattle Indian Health Board, centering youth and young adult health concerns during this crisis. Provide a link to that event when it comes available. Please let us know if you have other ideas for how we can be good partners to you during this time. Be safe and be well. With great respect, Zachary DeWolf, Chandra Hampson, and Denise Juneau. With that, I am going to move us into executive session. So the board is now immediately reset, recessing the regular board meeting into executive session to discuss with legal counsel representing the agency litigation or potential potential litigation to which the agency, the governing body or a member acting in an official capacity is or is likely to become a party when public knowledge regarding the discussion is likely to result in an adverse legal or financial consequence to the agency for RCW 42.30.1101I with a session scheduled for 30 minutes with an anticipated end time of 3.25 p.m. Directors will be leaving this remote meeting now for the duration of the executive session. I will return to this remote meeting with, with uh, enough directors for a quorum 
to make announcements should the executive session run past the schedule end time and to adjourn the regular board meeting at the conclusion of the executive session. So directors, you have been provided separate call in and teams information for our executive session. Please leave this regular meeting now and join me in a remote meeting for the executive session. Thank you all.
executive session to discuss with legal counsel representing the agency litigation or potential litigation to which the agency, the governing body, or a member acting in an official capacity is or who is likely to become a party when public knowledge regarding the discussion is likely to result in an adverse legal or financial consequence to the agency was originally scheduled for approximately 30 minutes. We are running long and the session is now expected to go an additional 15 minutes with an anticipated end time of 3.42. PM. Thank you.
everybody. Okay, so I see we have uh, Director, Director Hampson Smith, is here. Director Mack, Director Hampson, and I think that is good enough for us. So I will. The board is recessed out of executive session and the regular board meeting is now reconvened at 3.43 p.m. And there being no further business to come before the board, the regular board meeting is now adjourned at 3.44 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.